Good morning. It's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and in Senior Booksellers. And this is uh, another one of uh, my programs on uh, world history live on Facebook. So here we go. And uh, we are going to do program 54. And today is the 27th of October 2022. So very, you know, the, the work continues and, of course, some things do come to an end. For example, uh, you know, uh, today something different. I'll be doing Banjo Patterson uh, poems as usual, but also Henry Lawson poem. Uh, I've chosen one of his rather than do, just continue with the short stories all the time. They're very long, uh, the short stories. Uh, and he is a journalist, poet. Henry Lawson, quite a talented man. So that, that's uh, that's the new thing for today, and I'll continue with um, showing you uh, parts of Australia uh, from uh, Timber Creek. That's uh, we came from the Tim uh, Nitmilook National Park, in you know, in the Timber Creek, and then uh, we got to Lake Argyle. You know, it's all on the way uh, from Darwin to Broome, of course. So we're still in the, uh, we, you know, we are still in the Northern Territory. What, uh, what can I say now is uh, we continue the very interesting aspect of um, European and Middle Eastern contacts. Uh, welcome to Zoraida Rupmoros. Uh, the contact between Europe and the Middle East, uh, especially over Jerusalem, uh, uh, the, you know, that's the, the sort of city centre uh, where Christ, uh, you know, Palestine, uh, Christ was born. Uh, and therefore, it's uh, it's an area that uh, the, the three major religions of those areas claim. And it, it's, there's a real problem. The only way to do it, is, of course, is uh, to live in peace with each other. And each um, group should be able to uh, should be able to have a piece of the cake. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you know, you've got three major religions uh, claiming one area. It's a bit a bit hard. So if we really think that religion will give us um, that peace and that path to a better life, then. We better learn to to sort of live in peace with each other, and especially those groups in those areas. There, uh, I'm no judge of it. I haven't lived there. I haven't been. Sorry about that. People keep on ringing, and uh, you know I have to answer it. As, otherwise, the beeping keeps going, and uh, it's not no one, no one that belongs to me. This is just one of those, uh, you know, calls that people make continually. Unbelievable. Anyway, let's go on. So, we are now going to do that. We continue with Chinese history and uh, today is a very interesting one because we're going to do uh, the story of Hua Mulan, uh, a sort of a, a girl soldier uh, in, a, in a place in ancient China where women had to stay home, basically. And she pretended to be a, a, a real soldier. Not a, not a bad story. The ancient history of, of uh, America continues, and uh, we've seen how the early people uh, from other places migrate to America. And, and, of course, the USA, Canada, all the, the Americans want to know uh, what happened there before the arrival, of course, of uh, the Europeans via Christopher Columbus and other explorers. Uh, and there's always a problem, you know, the, the, it's, it's a clash of cultures, clash of cultures, and the culture that uh, that is stronger dominates, and, uh, the, you know, the, the others uh, are victims. But today we're trying to give... Uh, we're trying to give 
you know, a sort of um, recognition of the hurt that has been occurred via the migration of so many people from all over the world to other places where people have been there for a long, long time. The, the natives, the, the indigenous people of those areas. But uh, the world now is one, honestly. These are all old things. We have to look outside of Earth now into the universe. That's our saving factor, the universe. Asunda Lombardi, welcome again. It's 11.30 and uh, I won't mention anything else uh, there they'll before, the, before the invasion, of course. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. And uh, I've already mentioned Banjo Patterson and uh, Henry Wilson and my trip. Okay, so we can start. We can start uh, program 54. <laughs> not bad at all, not bad at all. Uh, I'm happy for that. Now, we left that um, the, the Turkish ill treatment of pilgrims and cru uh, created a first crusade in the, into the Middle East uh, that the Pope called upon the, the rest of Europe to, to sort of join and go and sort of protect the, the pilgrims who were being uh, not, you know, being ill-treated. And as a result of that, the crusade, the first crusade start, started and it was a success, the first one, but there were seven or eight of them and the rest of them, uh, they didn't go anywhere. But let's have a look at what happened, what happened. Okay, this is Crusades Rule Jerusalem for 88 years. And I've written it here from uh, 1187 to 1275. Uh, they they, they cr created a, a kingdom and they ruled it for 88 years. But then uh, Saladin, uh, one of the Muslim uh, great warriors and also great, uh, great leader, uh, he, he he beat the Christians, but in, then he, he made peace with them. He said, "You can you can stay here, you can do whatever, but you know I am the boss, sort of thing." So he put things in the place so that other people could stay on and worship uh, their own, you know, in their own ways. Here, let's go. So, led by a great French knight, Godfrey of Bouillon. The Crusaders captured Jerusalem and set up a Christian kingdom in Palestine. In 1187, 88 years later, however, the holy city was recaptured by the great Saracen leader Saladin. Saladin. The eight and last Crusades, I uh, thought it was seven, but anyway, the eight cru Crusades, this book says that. The eight and last Crusades began in 1270, but from time of Saladin, Onwards, Jerusalem itself and most of the surrounding lands remained firmly in the hands of the Muslims. Now, congratulations to the authors of uh, this particular book because it was written 70 years ago. You know, it's a long time ago. And, uh, you know, the idea that after World War II that the world should be, uh, you know, we should look at the world in a, in a more uh, sort of intelligent way. Uh, by studying the various customs, and uh, this succeeds. So here we, we go. So Jer Saladin onwards, Jerusalem itself and most of the surrounding lands remained firmly in the hands of the Muslims from then on until recent times, and it's still going on. Crusaders returned with new things and ideas from the Saracens. But what the clashes do... When you fight, you actually then get to know each other pretty well. And then after the big fights, there is peace. There's always peace after the wars. But we can't maintain peace with peace, can we? We succeed sometimes. Thus, the Crusaders failed to regain the Holy Land for Christendom. But they had other very important results. Tens of thousands of the soldiers of the cross... From runaway serfs to great kings like Richard the Lionheart, brought back to Europe new things and new ideas from the East. Mathematics and chemistry, carpets and glassware made their appearance. 
Previously, honey had been the only sweetening substance known to the West. But after the Crusades, cane sugar began to appear on rich men's tables. Thus, European life was enriched by many of the achievements of Islamic civilization, about which you read in the first part. We read in the first part of this of this um, book of this chapter. So, in other words, the clashes between you know the the Europeans and the Middle Easterns, if you like, including the Turkish and the Arab world, it created. Um, created greater civilization for the world. Uh, you know, Spain was ruled by, by the Muslims for a long time. And, uh, you know, they lived in peace there with the Christians and the, and, and the Jews, basically. But until, you know, politics, politics always gets in the way of, uh, you know, a period of peace, <laughs> because there was new generations and uh, new ambitions, you know, growing up. So you can understand it. You know, we only live for a period of time. So the new ones who come after us, they are not born with the wisdom of uh, knowing the history. And sometimes they, if you migrate to another country, and it's happened here, right here in Melbourne, if you migrate here. And your second, third, fourth generation, if you don't make a real effort to get to know your roots, you, you, you know, you, you lose them. Or at least, you know, they're very faint in you. So it's important to study history. The Crusades and chivalry. One of the things that came out of uh, what Saladin did, uh, because... He asked the Europeans who had fought him to remain back in Jerusalem, in Palestine. Then when some of those people went back to Europe and said, look how civilised he is, we've got to learn from that. So the idea of chivalry started. The Crusaders helped to, to increase the influence of chivalry in medieval times in medieval life and times. A chivalrous person is polite and considers the feelings of others important. He is truthful and brave and likes to help those who are weaker than himself. It's a Christian thing. Good. Above all, he's a good sport. He likes, you know, to be physically active. One who can lose cheerfully and can be generous to a beaten enemy. So I fight you, you lose. Okay, well, you know, I sort of won, okay, but I'm not going to eliminate you altogether. I'm going to be saying, it's like what we do here with um, when we got to the poles in Australia. It's beautiful. You got to the poles and, uh, you know, the night after or the same night, you get to know the results. And if the people in government lose, they just go out. The new one says, I'll come in now. From then on, all those people who were leaders of a nation. They move aside. The people will help them lose their jobs. And the other ones come in and they give jobs that they made. And, they have, and that's how democracy works. Democracy is a bit messy. But it is sort of... Um, you know, there's an element of chivalry about it and there's an element of niceness about it that you don't fight, you know, your, your enemy. In other words, when people go to the polls, the, the, the politicians have they say and they disagree with each other and whatever. But once, you know, the people have spoken, that's it. So chivalry is an important aspect in today's world. And that's the problem, for example. But, but at the time of the Middle Ages, there was no democracy as such. They were, you know, the, the strong ruled. They're monarchs with an ability. Except, so things have sort of changed. They changed a bit, but, uh, you know, what do we take out of history? You take the best out of it and uh, 
be aware of the worst part. So one, one who can lose cheerfully and can be generous to a beaten enemy. By the end of the Dark Ages, Christian teaching had softened the barbarity of the European peoples. But even so, when Godfrey's men captured Jerusalem, they mercilessly butchered their defeated enemies. They killed them all. So actually, I've, I've been watching Arthur Resurrection. Uh, this is a... Uh, an, uh, it's it's the hundreds of episodes um, from you know the the establishment of the Seljuk Empire, sort of Seljuk Empire Ottomans, the Christians and the Byzantine Christians and the Mongols all coming together. It's a very interesting uh, series. This one, uh, well worth watching. Honestly, you learn a lot. But it's pro-Islam. And the Christians always get a bad rap in that particular, uh, in, in that particular, uh, in, this, in, in all of the episodes, really. But it comes from here. Christian teaching. So, God, they mercilessly butchered their defeated enemies. Riding, said their leader, in a letter to the Pope, in the blood of the Saracens up to the knees of their horses. So they were really cruel. Saladin, yet when the chivalrous Saladin recaptured the city, he gave life and liberty to his Christian enemies. Again, the idea of chivalry that you, you know, you don't kill everyone off. Who's going to pay the taxes then? Who's going to do the work? You need people, you know, it's nothing worse than when you don't have enough people to do the jobs that you need them for. And, you know, again, modern times. Uh, we are in that position right now in Australia. Tournaments, now this way, the, you know, back to the Roman times, but in a different way. Many crusaders must have returned home determined to improve their own manners by the Saracen example. And from the 12th century on, chivalrous behaviour became more common in European literature and life. Just or tournaments were often held in which armoured knights mounted on horseback fought each other before large audiences according to strict rules of chivalry in much the same way as schoolboys today may take part in a boxing match. That's the, this is, you know, sort of after the war this book was written. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, today we sort of have... We love sport for that reason. It, it's it's a way it, competition. It's better than fighting with swords, etc. Even though even sword fights can be had, but in a very you know in a different uh, with different aims in mind. Well, basically, that's it. A couple of pictures here. Uh, I'd like to see you to see here these two people: Richard Kerr the Lion, the Lionheart, and Saladin, and also the Juists here. You've seen this on television, and this is uh, the Mosque of Santa Sophia. Okay, in Istanbul, Constantinople. And it's been, you know, Christian at one stage and Muslim now. Uh, you know, very, very beautiful apparently. I haven't been there. So I'll go to it when you can. Because sometimes then wars come and you can't go. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's it for, uh, for, you know, this part of history. And now we go to China. And with China, it's an important, uh, important uh, little story here, but it's a true story. And I think at uh, Insegna, I've got some um, stories about Hua Mulan, but I didn't know about her at all. Okay. So I'll show you a couple of pictures afterwards, but let me read this first. 
Huamulan joined the army in place of her father. Click, 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 Mulan wove cloth in the house. Yet we could not hear the sound of the shuttle, but the sound of Mulan's sighs. Uh, I'd like to fight. Yeah. This is the opening of the Ballad of Mulan, a well-known folk song in North China. The heroine of this ballad was a heroic woman in the north named Hua Mulan. H-U-A Mulan, M-U-L-A-N. The song tells how Hua Mulan disguised herself as a man and joined the army in place of her father. It is said that Mulan lived in the northern Wei dynasty and that people in the north were fond of practicing martial arts. When Mulan was about 10 years old, her father, an ex-soldier, taught her military skills, including martial arts, horse riding, archery and swordsmanship. Wang Mulan also read her father's books on military science in her spare time. Quite a girl. Quite a girl. Now, I've been watching as well now the, uh, the series, the Kin, Din, the Kin Empire. Very interesting, and it talks about the various um, uh, the various states of northern China before they were united under under the Qin as the Qin Empire, under the Qin tribe that conquered them all. After Emperor Xiao Wen's reform, the northern Wei dynasty saw a picture of socio-economic development and more stable lives. Now, welcome to Maria Anna Casino. Now, in China at the time, the reason why the Qin Empire became Qin Empire, they changed the way they used to handle government. They said that government and society should be run not by classes of people, but by merit. Uh, so, you know, sort of, it's a, it's, it's a bit like, you know, what, what's happening in China today. But it's under communism. You know, it's communism, but uh, it's not quite. It's sort of China, China, China history has given the Chinese people a long, long history of how they should behave under the emperors. They used to strong leaders and to follow to the letter whatever... Uh, law they pass, that they, they, they're allowed to go through because they've got the ultimate say. They used to. And I think Xi Jinping has still got it now. You know, all of these um, countries that have strong religions at the top uh, and they stayed there for 20, 30 years, whereas here we change them, you know, in Britain at the moment, there are three, three of them in two months, the premiers, the people who make the laws, and then the king is a stamp. It's, it's monarchy, the British monarchy is a different type of monarchy to the others because there were fights, you know, after Elizabeth I uh, in Cromwell time, etc., things changed, you know. Uh, the, the, it's constitutional monarchy different from just pure monarchy. Okay, now, to ward off incursions, let's go back. After Emperor Xiao Wen's reform, the Northern Wei dynasty saw a picture of socio-economic development and more stable lives. To ward off incursions by the Ruren nomads, the rule of the Northern Wei ordered that every household provide a man to join an expedition against them. Mulan's father... That's the same rule as in Europe under, under the system uh, that uh, was developed after Charlemagne. Mulan's father was old then and her younger brother was too young to go and fight. So Mulan decided to join the army instead of her father. Mulan spent 12 years in the army. Fighting at the border is even hard for many men, let alone a girl such as Mulan, because she had to conceal her identity. 
while fighting against the enemy together with her partner. But Tua Mulan finally completed her mission and returned home with victory 12 years later. In view of her exploits on the battlefield, the ruler of the Northern Wei offered Mulan a high official position, but she refused it. Tua Mulan, for her braveness and purity, has been highly respected as a filial daughter by the Chinese people for hundreds of years. In 1998, the story was adapted into an animated cartoon by Disney in the United States to the acclaim of viewers young and old. And now China, of course, uh, I don't know what's happening to Wang Mulan, but I'll just show you the sort of picture that is in this book here. There she is, Wang Mulan. And that's one of the temples dedicated to her. Okay, and you can look it up. Oop. Uh, what, am I doing? what am I doing here? Sorry. Come on. Here we are, back again. <laughs> oh dear, dear, dear. What do I do? Oh God, unbelievable. Never mind. Sorry about that. It's like an interval, you know. You, uh, you go from one place, one one thing to another, and you have a little break in the middle, so you stuff up something. <laughs> okay, we're going to North America now. Before, again, the invasion by the Europeans. But even thousands of years earlier, let's go. There's a, a connection... Uh, you know, they're doing studies in North America now, in, in America as such, uh, to find out where the natives, the indigenous people, came from initially after the last ice age. So, Dene Yeniselan, Dene Yeniselan language family proposal. This is another explanation. Okay. A relationship between the Na Dene languages of North America, such as Navajo and Apache, and the Yeniseyan languages of Siberia was first proposed as early as 1923 and developed further by others. A detailed study was done by Edward Vida and published in 2010. This theory received support from many linguists with archaeological and genetic studies providing it with further support. Now it says, swipe left to reveal comments and reactions. Swipe left. Oh, I've got it. So <laughs> I've got you back now, uh, Maria Anna and Asunt and Zoraida. <laughs> Pardon me for all my interruptions. That's part of what I do, I like to digress and and make comments about history as we move along. No use just being so formal about it. Uh, it's my way, and that's that's you know. If you follow me, uh, you have to put up with that. And but don't forget, you can go over my my work now online in insenia dot com, <clears throat> even on YouTube. So. That's it. That's the way it is. Now, let's go back. We're saying that here they're saying that the Dene Yenisayan language family proposal. In other words, if you look at the language, say, because this talks about Siberia and, and America and some of the groups in North America and the groups in Siberia, in northern part of uh, uh, Russia, you know, not Russia, the Soviet Union of once, you know, northern part of Asia, there's a connection in the language. It's like, it's like uh, the best example I can give is uh, the Spaniards, 
the Spaniards arrived in South America and then the others remained where they were. But centuries later, if there was no connection between them, the, some of the language seems to be the same as what it's in Spain. He says, South America, how do you explain it? And that's what they're doing here in the studies here. By looking at the Navajo and Apache languages, you know, the, the, the local languages, the indigenous languages, and the, the, the Yenisayan languages of Siberia. Now again, Yenisayan, it's, a, it's, a, it's another area somewhere else. It was first proposed as early in 1923. So some, one of these people was studying that, you know, a century ago and developed further by others. A detailed study was done by Edward Vaida and published in 2010. This theory received the support from many linguists with archaeological and genetic studies providing it with further support. The Arctic small tool tradition of Alaska and the Canadian Arctic may have originated in East Siberia about 5,000 years ago. This is connected with the ancient Paleo-Eskimo peoples of the Arctic, the culture that developed by 2,500 years before Christ. The Arctic small tool tradition source may have been the Sialak Balkachi Imyatak cultures sequence of East Siberia dated 6,500 years to 2,800 years. So there's a big gap there in th thousands of years how, how these two other groups sort of are connected linguistically. But it's, it's, it's they're not, you know, pure connections. They're just approximations. The interior route is consistent with the spread of the Nadin language group and sub sub Low sub haplo group X to A into the Americas after the earliest Paleo American migration. Now, Paleo American, Paleo, the word Paleo is, means ancient, old. Ne Neolithic is new. The Paleo is really the early years 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, millions of years before when people first arrived. They're called Paleolithic men, Paleo. Uh, the ancient men. Nevertheless, some scholars suggest that the ancestors of Western North American speaking Nadin languages made a coastal migration by boat. Now, it's 11.57. I'm going to stop there for today on the Americas. Then I've got another couple of uh, sections here and then I'll be looking at uh, South and Central and North America uh, from my own point of view. I want to go more into it in terms of the actual indigenous groups. We've done the Aztecs, okay, the, the Maya people of Central America and North, uh, South America, North, South and Central America. I want to, I want to do a bit more studies on this, and also then maybe attach it to Africa as well. So that has to come. But we won't be able to stop this um, world history for quite a long time because some things I haven't covered. Therefore, things will continue. But I will also continue to do things on Australia and, uh, you know, both uh, from the point of view of literature, society uh, and, you know, the, the geography of the place and et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So stay with me. It's never the same, week by week. Now, this one here is, we're talking about the Indigenous people and how keeping the laws, okay? So, uh, where I was last time, I was, I went to, I went to, Sacred objects that men should see. So, sacred objects that men should see. I have to find this. Here we are. And I continue from last week. Professor Bent and Professor Alkin 
have written down the reports they collected from Aboriginal people who remembered how disputes were settled in northern South Australia. It was a system called the Kopara, Kopara system. This happened when a clan or a person was in debt to another clan or person because of receiving a gift or a woman or because of killing or wounding someone of the other clan. You should think amongst humans. You notice here, you know, over a woman or over a killing or over a theft. It happens. Until the debt was repaid in kind, a woman for a woman, a gift for a gift, a death for a death. The two clans were enemies. However, the elders of the two clans might come together and discuss the situation and decide that the Kapara could be finally settled if one clan served the other in some way, gave a woman or women or a boy to be initiated or in extreme cases offered a man to be killed. Well, Professor Meggett has listed the crimes and minor offences recognised by the Walbiri or Walpiri of the Central Desert and the punishment for each offence. The worst crimes were murder and breaking religious laws. These were punished by death. Minor offences were insulting someone or failing to do duties such as bringing food to older relatives the punishment for this might be ridicule or calling names or beating the person with a club or other weapon. In between were offences which deserved a, sp a spearing in the thigh. In doubtful cases, the punishment was decided by one or more of the older ritual leaders. So you have to be punished somehow or stick a lance into your, <laughs> into your thigh so you'll remember me for a long time. <laughs> what you did. And uh, in my reading of Dante Alighieri, the Divine Comedy, you know, that's exactly a lot of the punishments, uh, the punishment in hell are pretty brutal as well. So the, this thing about, you know, punishments goes right across humanity. The, you know, we always, I don't know why, but it's just unbelievable. Yet if somebody has something wrong, what do you do? And if they keep on doing it, what do you do? Do you club them? If somebody kills, you know, two, three, four, five people, what do you do? You leave, let them go? We put them in jail now. Before it was nice and quick, boom. Does it mean you agree with that? What about if somebody's innocent? That's where, you know, you have to see both. You have to see it um, in a very judicial way. Okay, marriage rules and kinship laws were important. An arranged marriage was not supposed to be broken without good cause. Heavy pressure was brought on the young girls to go on to the to the husbands to whom they had been promised. You follow the men. An older husband might suspect his young wife of having a young man as a lover and might gather some of his male relatives together to punish the young men. And if they speared him, public opinion would be on the side of the old husband. So that's how they, they did it. So the young women were promised to older men. And that's probably why in Australia uh, never had such a big, big population. Never more than some people, that's what I've heard, more than a million people in the whole of the continent, including Tasmania. We don't know how many people lived in Australia uh, before, you know, we've only taken a census here in Australia since 1967. Before that, before then, uh, they weren't counted in the census. You know, you, had to, you would have had to travel to the northern part of Australia in, in you know, in remote areas, very difficult. So, but today we can do it. And today, governments in general, of all sides, they are responsible. They may becoming responsible for the whole of the nation, of the boundaries of Australia. All of those lands come under 
the rider of the government. And the government should should be, and, and it, it's going that way, uh, it represents all groups, one family, one family. So, I don't know, this is becoming a bit of an issue here, uh, but, but I think it's important to remember uh, that, you know, we have to have our minds about the past, accepted for what it was, the cruelty, the slavery, the, the punishment, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the real objectionable behaviour uh, by the rulers. Not always, but most of the time. Now, we need to work it out. It's hard. I'm not saying it's easy at all. But it's important to work it out and to bring Indigenous people, people come from overseas recently, and the people who live here, to, to sort of have fairness and fairness in place for everybody. Mm. Now we come to our friends. I'm going to start, because this time, I'm going to start with uh, uh, with Henry Lawson, and this is a poem he wrote in 2000 and no, no in uh, 19, 1906. Hundred sixteen years ago. Okay, let's. And I am picking it up from the iPhone, from Google, etc., because now. We can access literature, history, uh, all this from our computers, our tablets. We have a lot of information thrown at us or available to us. The point is some people can get confused by it all. The reality is that you have to own the wisdom that you acquire through reading these things with a critical eye. Because sometimes what you, you know, with this easy access, the quicker you sort of, the access, the quicker we forget. So it's important to, to sort of relax, get a couple of books, read them slowly, think about it, etc. You can do it with the tablet, but you can see when I got it wrong, it just goes high wire and we've got a problem. Well, the thing is, one does not exclude the other. And coming from a bookseller, <laughs> it's understandable as well. But I, I don't think that uh, really affects me all that much in my judgment. But I think, you know, I can't escape the realities of life. Okay, let's go. Let me read it. Henry Lawson. It's called Bush High. The stamp of Scotland is on his face, but he sailed to the south a lad, and he does not think of the black bleak hills and the bitter hard youth he had. He thinks of a nearer and dearer past in the bright land far away. When the teams went up and the teams came down in the days when they made bush hay. So this guy came from Scotland. Big, cold, big hills, big mountains, cold country. And here, northern New South Wales, Queensland, hot. The fair was rough and the bush was grim. The fair, well, you ate in the years of his pilgrimage, but he gained the strength that is still with him in his hale, late middle age. He thinks of the girl at the halfway inn they used as a bun today. Oh, she was a dumpling and he was thin in the days when they made bush hay. So they loved the, the hay. She was a dumpling. Huh? And he was like a little rake, 
So, the ration teams to the Bathurst Plains were often a fortnight full, and they branched all ways in the early days and back to the port with wool. They watched for the lights of Old Cove and Co that flashed to the west away. When a drivers drove six on a 12-mile stage in the days when they made bush hay. That's the delivery of the wool. He has made enough and he sold his claim and he goes by the morning train from the gold-filled town in the sultry west to his home by the sea again. He's got plenty of money, now he can go back to Scotland occasionally, I suppose. When a bustling old boy Body's expecting him, whose hair is scarcely grey, and she was the girl of the halfway house in the days when they made bush hay. <laughs> so he has, he has made enough and he sold his claim. So he sold up and he goes by the morning train from the goldfield town in the sultry west, the sultry west, to his home by the sea again where a bustling old bodies expecting him, whose hair is scarcely grey. And she was the girl of the halfway house in the days when they made Boucher. So she was expecting him somewhere else. So there you are. As you grow older, then you meet your old friends. They've changed. No? That's it. That's a beautiful poem. And I read it from here. There you are. You can do it too. You need a couple of them to do the work, but it's important. There's another one here, but this one here from our famous book, A.B. Patterson, and if you get a copy, it's good. Selected Poems by Les Murray. My son gave it to me. Dear Dad, Merry Christmas 2008. Yeah. Lots of love, always, Jason. So thank you, Jason, for this uh, gift. It's been taking me a, a number of years to get to it, but we're finally here. A Walgett episode. Walgett, W-A-L-G-E-T-T. -E the sun strikes down with a blinding glare. The skies are blue and the plains are wide. The salt bush plains that are burned and bare by Walgett out on the Barwon side. The Barwon River that wanders down in a leisurely manner by Walgett town. Yeah, well, if it was today, uh, you know, this would be covered in water. Totally. Amazing. The amount of water that we've received this year and it's still raining outside. All those people who lost um, homes and what a disaster. Well, this is the land. I was just thinking about it too. I think what we need in Australia is go back to the Middle Ages a little bit in those wide lands, you know, where, the, the, where, where, where you can have rivers overflowing, you can have the floods. We need some places like, like the old castles where people can gather in times of trouble. Large places which are well protected. So it's like, you know, it's like you have something somewhere that's central uh, and you've protected all around in case of the floods. So the floods so far have been 15 metres. Well, you built something 20 metres high. So that when the, when the floods arrive, the people in there are protected at least. You don't lose people. But you will lose the, the rest. And you to think what sort of what sort of construction shall we have in case it floods? Okay. There came a stranger, a cockatoo, the word means farmer, as all men know, who dwell in the land where the kangaroo barks loud at dawn. And the white-eyed crow uplifts his song on the stockyard fence as he watches the lambkins, lambkins passing ends. The sunburnt stranger was gaunt and brown, 
but it soon appeared that he meant to flout the iron law of the country town, which is that the stranger has got to shout. If he will not shout, we must take him down, remarked the yokels of Walga town. So if you came and you were a stranger, you had to shout, I am here, don't shoot. But if you don't, they'll shoot you first. They baited a trap with a crafty bait, with a crafty bait for they held discourse concerning a new chum who of late had bought such a, a thoroughly lazy horse. They would wager that no one could ride him down the length of the city of Walga town. The stranger was born on the horse's hide, so he took the wages and made them good with his hard-earned cash, but his hopes they died, for the, the horse was a, a close horse made of wood. Made of, twas well-known horse that he had taken down, full, full many a stranger in Walgett town. For the horse was, I don't understand that one, but we'll keep going. The stranger smiled with a sickly smile. This is a sickly smile that the loser grins. And he said he had travelled for quite a while in trying to sell some marsupial skins. And I thought that perhaps as you took me down, you would buy them from me in Walgett town. He said that his home... Okay, away you go. I'll keep my hands there. He said that his home was at Wingadi, at Wingadi where he had for sale some 50 skins and would guarantee they were full-size skin with the ears and tail, complete, and he sold them for money down to a venturesome buyer in Walgett Town. Then he smiled, a smile as he pounced the pelf. I'm glad that I'm quit of them, win or lose. You can fetch them in when it suits yourself and you'll find the skins on the kangaroos. Then he left and the silence settled down like a tangible thing upon Walgett Town. Oh, this needs a bit of more study, this one here. A Walgett episode. So he, he was selling marsupial skins. He tried to sell my super skins. So he was trying to fool the, the locals. And so they didn't really like him <laughs> that much, I think. That's the way it was. Anyway, look, look it up. Look up uh, this uh, particular um, poem. It's called, it's called uh, Walgett, Walgett. You can look it up too. A Walgett episode by Benja Patterson. Okay, I finished now with um, my, you know, what I do, uh, and now we have to go to uh, my trip. And I think that's an interesting part for me. But what I have to do now is do the usual, get my computer going. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Come on. No. Oh, yeah, it's come up. Okay. Now, let me get it right. Yes, got it. Straight away. Okay. Well, it's 12.18. We've got 12 minutes or a little bit more. And, uh, you know, I'll give it a bit more today. Here we go. That's it now. I was, I'll go back. Where was I? All right, I'll go back here again and I'll find the place where I was. Here, I was right here. There. I was in the bus. Okay, we're going to go from there and let's have a look. This is Timber Creek. We're going towards Timber Creek. Okay, and then we keep, keep going. There we go. Beautiful, you know, wide spaces. Timber Creek, Catherine Daly, Australia. Look at that.
did, did you see that convoy of uh, you know a truck like a train? Amazing. And the roads are always straight. Not many curves around here. What a beautiful area. Next one. And as soon as I see a bit of water, I'm always onto it. Well, in Australia, water is life. But except when it floods a lot, it's different. Here we go, look at this, this other type of... See the flatness of the earth, of the terrain. Great. This is Judd Burra, Gregory National Park, Gregory Catherine Daly, Australia. Judd Burra. Just to get it, give you the idea, you know what I mean? And you get hours and hours and hours of this. But, in all fairness, the, the bus driver stopped every hour and a half, two hours, for us to, you know, they called them the toilet breaks and drinks as well, and food. Here we are. Look at the landscape. And notice those fat trees, the boababs, boabab trees, boabab trees, the big ones. You'll see a few of them along the way. You're not getting a lot here because I'm only taking a little bit because of, um, you know, the, every so often. That's Baines now. We're going into in Baines. Baines, Catherine Daly, Australia. Look at that. Flat, flat, flat. Kilometres and kilometres of it. I think on this day we travelled about eight hours or more. More. After this um, aspect here, I started taking some stills, but I wanted to show the land and the way it sort of you know, when people say the Australian government has to do this and that, look what they've got in front of them. And now we're starting to see some of the rocks going up. There are the barb tree. See that barb tree? I stopped it on purpose. Look at that. That is a beautiful tree. There are so many of them. When I first saw this one here, I couldn't believe it, how, you know, what they looked like. I wasn't used to it. There's another one there. Another one.
There you are. This is the brown land for me, huh? Beautiful. Amazing. This is a different terrain here again. This is Baines in Catherine Daly, Australia. Baines. I didn't want to miss um, taking, you know, studying the, the, the terrain as we moved along. Very nice. Oh, oh, that one. I didn't see that one. This one here. Oh, that was an easy one. Okay. Going too fast. Welcome to Beni Lajura. This is Baines in Catherine Daly, Australia. I think we're still in the Northern Territory here. And then we're going towards Western Australia. Here we are. And this is Lake Argyle. In Lake Argyle, we, we're going to, and this is where we stop for refreshments, etc., and then we continued. Look at this. Cockatoos, looks like cockatoos. Huh? Look at this tree. What are those? A lot of planes that I didn't know. They are looking at the birds. and the brown land, Lake Argyle area. Welcome, and here, welcome to Western Australia. There we are, a great place, it's true. So after this, there you are, I took a bit of time off. So, and that's this, you've got to go through there for the controls to enter Western Australia. Come on. Beautiful, look at that. Look at that. What a lovely picture. It was getting dark by that time. Back on the road. We are in Western Australia now. Whoa! <laughs> I, I decided to take pics after that. And these are people are, sunset is arriving. And here. So that's a few, a bit of pictures of Western Australia. Big rock formations there. This is the Lake Argyle area. So, 
I was interested in, in there in the in the sunset. Catherine Darwin, there we are, look at that. Lake Argyle, the version Wyndham, etc. And this is where we arrived. That was accommodation place. And this was the food that was served to us. Not bad. Well organised. Look at that. Sorted fresh bluefin tuna. Very nice. Coffee. And that's where we were. Nice area. Reception. Oh, this must be... <laughs> That's my sister and me. So we got there. Well done. Well done. Uh, uh, uh. Angela, we're starting today at six thirty, and uh, you said let's go for a walk out. I'm going to stop there because it's eleven thirty-one. And this is now Lake Argyle. The next morning we started, so it'll be good to stop there and see you all next week. Uh, in the meantime, please, I make a real plan. I'm pleading with people, really. I'm, what I would like people to do is to actually share my work with your people. Uh, I think there is enough there of interest to, you know, to promote the idea of history and all the other things that I do here. So I need some people to, you know, there are a lot of people that are coming on during the week, about between 70 and 100 at the moment for each one of the uh, online presentations that I make. But I do need people to share this work in order... Uh, for it uh, to to encourage others to uh, to study history, world history is important. Come on, do it. Okay. On that note, thank you very much for coming on, for the people who have, and for the people going to come on afterwards. And uh, don't forget, after you've seen it, make a comment, express, direct me to something that you want me to cover. Uh, tell me what, which are the parts that you enjoy the most. And if it's boring for you, that's okay. You can always turn it off. But, you know, if you do like it, make a, a good comment about it, about what, what I've presented. Okay, on that note, ciao. Until next time, Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insegna Booksellers. Ciao.